Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. Just for a moment, this will be a starting place, the book of Revelation. All right? We will not be here, and uh, I make no apology for tonight or over the next few weeks. We will be in a lot of Scripture, even tonight. And uh, so I hope you came uh, with your fingers all worked up and uh, stretched out and ready to go. And uh, because we'll be in God's Word a lot, we will be searching the Scriptures and doing a lot of cross-referencing. And uh, I've entitled this message or this series... Uh, denominations and church names rightly divided. Denominations and church names rightly divided. Over the years of being a pastor and serving in the ministry, I cannot begin to tell you how many times I have been approached from individuals could be new to a church, it could be individuals who are unsaved. It could be individuals who have been in a church a very long time. And have asked this very question. Maybe you have asked it and no one's ever given you an answer. Well, I'm going to endeavor to do that, but I, I'm, I'm going to do my best through the Scripture to give you um, scriptural um, guidance and leave out my opinion because my opinion does not matter. And by the way, we all have an opinion. But they've asked this question, why are there so many different churches and denominations? You ever thought about that? How come there's so many churches and denominations? Do you know? You ever wonder why? And, and um, I want to explain this and this question, and some of it came up even recently when... I just taught through a message or series on the church that God would attend. And um, if you go through Martinsville, Henry County, if you go through, you go through every county. You, I don't know how many states you have been in. I don't know where you've traveled. I don't know if you've even gone out west. I don't know how far north you have gone. I don't know how far south you have gone. But if you travel anywhere, or if it's just in your own city and county, you know what you find? You find all types of churches with different names and different denominations. Now, have you ever wondered what a church name meant? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered what in the world does that denomination believe? Have you ever wondered, hey, I'll just go ahead and throw this out there. All right, I'll be the first one to throw a hand grenade out there. I don't care. You ever wondered what in the world do Baptists believe? And why do, are they called Baptists? Well, I'm not going to do an exhaustive study on every religious denomination. Okay, that, that, uh, there isn't enough time, all right? But until Jesus comes again, we will have time to study this out a little bit, all right? And so we want to learn a little bit about, to answer the question, the thought, where did they come from and why are there so many? And to answer this question, to give you a good start and a foundation, look at Revelation chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 6. Revelation chapter 2, and there are two different religious groups that are mentioned in this chapter. So Revelation chapter 2, I want you to look at first verse 6. The Bible says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolo Nicolaitans, which I also hate. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Here what you have is you have many believe that the Nicolaitans were a religious sect, a religious group that followed a man by the name of Nicholas. Okay, I think you can see that there. That, that's why they're called Nicolaitans, because they followed a man by the name of Nicholas. But I want you to notice in verse 6, that thou hatest the deeds. Everyone say deeds. 
they follow the deeds, which are actions and practices, all right? Their deeds were what distinguished this group. Now, this foundation I'm setting for you is very important, so I need you to pay attention, or the rest of this will just kind of be a blur to you, and you will hear a lot of different names and denominations, and you won't really focus on what their, what their purpose is. This group here focused on their deeds. I want you to notice a contrast to that. Look at verse 14. Bible says Jesus is speaking here and John, he is having a revelation. The apostle John, and he says, Jesus says to him in a vision, a dream, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold a doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Notice he said, I have a few things against thee because they're them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Here you have a different group of Balaamites, if you will, because they're distinguished now as a different group because they have held true to the doctrine of Balaam. So let me review. You have the deeds of the Nicolaitans and you have the doctrine of uh, the Balaamites. You have the deeds, which are the actions and the preferences, and then you have the doctrine of the Balaamites. The word doctrine, every time you hear that word or see that word, that means whatever is believed or taught by someone. Doctrine means whatever is taught. So let's answer the question, why are there so many different churches and denominations in the world where there's basically two reasons, and there will be a couple of thoughts that will come up on the screen for you that will help you. And here it is. People hold to differences in deeds and their deeds, which are actions and practices of the church or the way that the church does things. Some people hold to certain actions or deeds that their church does because that's what their church does. Now here's the problem with that. A lot of times people will take what a church does and their tradition and make a doctrine out of it. Can you see the problem with that? Well, we have communion every Sunday. Well, that's awesome. Have it every Sunday if you want to. But just because someone doesn't have it every Sunday doesn't mean they're out of God's will. The Bible says as often as you do. It didn't say do it every Sunday. If you want to do it every Sunday, do it every Sunday. But if your church has it every Sunday in taking communion, let's be real clear about it, folks. That is a deed or action of the church. It is not a doctrine of the church. Can I hear an amen? Do you understand the difference? Holding to communion is a doctrine. Observing communion is a doctrine of the church. It's something that we should do. Jesus said, you do this until I come. In other words, you continue to honor this and hold this true. But how you do it, and as alt as you do it, Jesus lets the church make that decision. So therefore, it is a deed of the church. So some people are identified... And hold their differences by their deeds. It's the way that the church acts. It's the way the church functions. It's the way it runs. It's how the church runs or its philosophy of ministry. And by the way, we have philosophy of ministries here. There are some ways that a church governs their business meetings. I was flat out told here... When I first arrived here, uh, that I was wrong 
and that I was not right because I didn't hold the business meetings here of our church by Robert's Rules of Order. Now I'm going to tell you something. I know what Robert's Rules of Order are. But I also want to declare to you, Robert's Rules of Orders are not inspired. Nobody anywhere... And what God says is the only thing that matters. God did not say, I have to follow the Robert's Rules of Order. So if you want to follow Robert's Rules of Order, have at it. If you don't want to follow Robert's Rules of Order, have at it. Just as long as there's order in the church. And sometimes we get this stuff confused, folks. And I just want to make sure we have the record straight. We have business meetings, and I thank God for them. But I'm also thankful that we are not a ministry that is run by meetings, because meetings are all about what needs to be done, but ministry gets it done. So you have to decide, are we going to be a ministry of meetings, or are we just going to be a ministry? And I, there are times for meetings. But people can get upset about preference issues. And you have a right to be upset about that if you want to. But let's not make that deed a, a doctrine. Are you with me now? All right. Amen. The second thing I want to share with you is that people hold the differences in doctrine. In their doctrine. People hold differences in their doctrine. Now we have deeds and doctrine. And this is what the church believes and what the church teaches. I will go slow and methodical through this on purpose. Because I do not want to lose you. I certainly do not want to bore you. However, I also want you to know, I believe that this is ever more important as the day approaches... Because churches will be called into accountability of who they are and what they are and why they exist. And I believe it's important to make sure that we continue to hold a strong stance of where we stand. And that is on God's word alone. We are sola scripture here. We believe in God's Word and we stand alone on the sufficiency of God's Word. And there is room and availability to put in church philosophy and our manner of way we do anything, but we will not elevate the color of our carpet by what Jesus has said. And folks, if we have to remove the carpet in here, may I say to you, we will not be going back to what we have. We will do it differently. Say why? Number one is because of cost. Number two, because of cost. Number three is because of, what is it? Thank you. Why? Because that's what's needed. So guess what? Our colors and our preferences will not be overridden because the budget is what will drive that decision. And sometimes we get all of that out of whack. But when it comes to doctrine, some people believe that you get saved through your good deeds. Some people believe that it's through your efforts and, efforts and the way that you keep the standards of the church. And some believe it's through keeping the law or keeping certain rituals of the church while others like ourselves believe what the Bible teaches, and that is a person is saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, and that there is no other means to obtain forgiveness or repentance into heaven other than through a person putting their faith and trust in the completed work of the cross. Folks, that's doctrinally accurate because it's what the Bible teaches. And so it's important that we elevate doctrine and put it as the number one priority 
and that we do not get the deeds or the actions confused. Say, why does that matter with this lesson? What has everything to do with it? And that will help you to understand why there are so many denominations and even church names. The Bible says in Amos 3, I love this, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Paul taught, the Apostle Paul taught that a local congregation should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There are times where people will leave a church, where people will uh, split a church, where people will do what they think they should do. But may I say to you, there is no reason for a person biblically to ever leave a church or to ever split a church unless it is over a doctrinal issue. But that is not what you find happening in the Christian realm or society today. What you find is that people take their deeds, their actions or their preferences, and they place them over what is taught. And it's important for us to remember, yes, we can walk together as long as we agree on doctrine. I will walk alongside of you as long as you want to go, and you can have every difference of opinion that you want to have that is contrary to what I do here, as long as there is not a difference and contrary to what the Bible says. And when there is disharmony there, then there will be division. That is natural. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 1.10. This will be on the screen. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak. Notice this, that ye all speak. He's writing to the church at Corinth. He's writing to, by the way, a wicked church. He, he rebukes the socks off of this church all the time. And when you get to 2 Corinthians, man, there are some scathing remarks. And, and I want to say to you, he is speaking to a church. Therefore, I believe that we should pay heed to what Paul says because he wrote to the church. Unlike any other writer of the Bible. He says, listen church, that you speak the same thing and that there be... What's that next word? Now, folks, you don't have to understand uh, Konania uh, uh, Aramaic. You don't have to understand Greek, which is the common language, uh, Konania, uh, uh, of, of when this Bible was written. You do not have to understand that. You don't have to understand Hebrew to understand what the word no means. No means no in every language and dialect out there. No is no. He says, let there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, here's the thing. Paul's not talking about double, uh, having double talk here because there are times to divide. But it must be when it can't be of the same mind and it cannot be uh, 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 of the same thing and, it can't, and when it's not in the right judgment. In other words, if we are the body of Christ, we should all agree on one commonality and that is God's holy word. We should be in agreement on this and, 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 and there should be a commonality on that. But Paul said, if we are on the same page spiritually, then there should be no divisions among you. What? We have disobeyed God's word. When I say we, I mean the body of Christ. 
Paul said there shouldn't be any, but there are. And I believe that is why there are over 38,000 different Christian denominations. 38,000. Differences in deed and differences in doctrine. 38,000? It is clear why there are so many differences. Because if everyone agreed on a literal interpretation of God's Word, if everyone agreed on rightly dividing God's Word, if everyone understood who our apostle is through the apostle Paul, who wrote 13 letters to the church, then there wouldn't be all these differences. Why? Because we'd be of the same mind. But that isn't the case now, is it? Some have even tried to downplay the importance of doctrine. I know you've heard this statement. If you've made this statement, I'm not trying to step on your toes. I don't have you in my mind. I've heard it so many times over the years, I don't know who have said it. I've lost track. But I've heard it. And I may have even said it. I've heard Christians say this. Let's forget about all our differences and let's just come together as one. Let's forget about all our differences and just come all together as one. And before you have the thought into your mind, well, what's wrong with that? I want to say to you, that that is warm and fuzzy, and I believe it might be a pie-in-the-sky kind of thinking. But the Apostle Paul taught that doctrine matters and doctrine should divide. Doctrine matters and doctrine divides. And I want to be clear about this with you. I cannot begin to tell you how many times people have to tried to change me over the years in just being the pastor here. From what I wear to how long I preach. From how the services are conducted to when we should have service even on what day. Cutting out services, man, the list is long. But I want to say to you about being clear on major doctrinal issues, not petty differences in preferences. People get hung up on the length of someone's hair. Donnie wish he had hair. People get hung up on dresses versus pants. Drums or no drums. Voting in church on certain issues. I've heard that argument here so many times, it's nauseating. If given the opportunity, at times, the church would vote on everything here. It's just a distraction unless it's over uh, an essential issue. Even how often communion is observed. I mean, I mean, a preference is, I mean, should the choir wear robes or even have a choir? And by the way, we don't have a choir. Have you noticed? Man, people got upset about that thing here. And I took it on the chin for that. I got blamed for killing the choir here. 
I want you to know there is nothing godly about having a choir or ha not having a choir. It's, it's not even in Scripture. If you want a choir, have a choir. If you don't want to have a choir, don't have a choir. I like a choir. I do. It, but it's my preference. So, Pastor, then won't we have a choir? Because you'd have me leading it. There's no one else to lead it. That's why there's no choir. No one, everyone stopped coming to choir practice. And that was explained. And you know what? People still said it was the pastor who killed it. What I'm saying to you is we get so upset about preferences. Man, let's talk about some doctrine. Man, I'd love to have a hundred member choir back here. Let's just get a hundred faithful members first. Then we'll talk about a choir. And we put the cart before the horse. And I'm thankful for a choir. I mean, let her rip, buddy. The louder, the better. But man, as that thing started to dwindle and as the thing started to fade, we were trying to force something that did not want to operate here. And see what we did? Donnie got up and said, Folks, we will no longer have a choir as of such and such a date. But here's a date to sign up and register for this event for Christmas. Everybody was worried. What are we going to do about Christmas cantata? What are we going to do about Christmas dramas? And, all this? And, and so we we're like, you know what? We'll take that into consideration. You're right. We'll give that some thought. You know what? We put a sign-up sheet out. You know how many signed up? Fifteen. And five of them were teenagers. Folks, I'm all for having it. But when I have a staff member that has to come every Sunday and be here at 4.30 along with a piano person and along with providing all the sheet music and buying sheet, uh, uh, create music and buying the books for that and buying the CDs and copying those for, for them to learn. Man, we were exhausting resources that we just didn't have for people who did not want to sing in the choir. But out here, they wanted a choir. Well, then come on up here and sing. <laughs> or come up here and lead it. Right, Brother Donnie? Donnie's like, man, I'm, I'm out. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not the guy. I'm going to resign from leading the choir. And you see what I did? I led him. I could have made him. Could have made him mad. But as his boss, I could have made him. But Why? Why fight that? Yeah, I'd love to have a choir. I mean, boy, the first few weeks, I mean, I had people come up to me and tell me, brother, we got to have, you should have a choir. Why? So you know what we did? We replaced it with more music and a, and, and a different type of atmosphere and all of that. We changed some things to compensate for that. And, and, and you know what? People who come into our church now, do you know they have no idea that we've ever had a choir? Why, it's not something they're accustomed to. You know what? It's not something that they had a preference to. But if we ever have a choir one day, man, I will root it on. I, I, I'll love it. But that was a preference issue. But people get so worked up. Man, man people get tore up about wanting to uh, 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 discuss... Uh, uh, in Genesis 6, where the sons of God came into the daughters of men. You ever studied that out? It'll blow your mind. Don't ask me after the service what that's about. I don't have a thumb on that. I have a thought about it. And I have a logical, uh, uh, which I seem, I believe to be logical, but I don't know. I have no idea why and the purpose the Bible put it in there, so I take it as true. But man, people, people want to divide over that. People want to get worked up about that. And I want us to go in God's Word for just the next few moments. And we're going to look up a lot of Scripture right now. And I want you to first to go to Galatians chapter 1. And I want us to get some insight on how doctrine is a divider. And how it distinguishes 
the kind of church that we should have. Now, every pastor, every body of leaders, and every church is going to have their preferences of how they operate the church. However, and I get that, and there's room for that, and that's awesome. I thank God for the liberty that we have in Jesus. I thank God that the church does not make me wear a tie, and that you, you folks, you guys, it's kind of interesting. Some issues are a big issue. You guys have, have, uh, could care less. You guys could care less if I wore jeans up here. Now, none, that, that doesn't bother And I thank the Lord for that. I, I do, because that doesn't bother you. Now, the choir thing bothers you, some of you, but the jeans thing doesn't bother you. And, and I thank the Lord for that, because there is liberty in that. Now, I, some churches, man... Everybody needs to be in a suit, you know, everyone on the platform, and everyone needs to be in a tie. And, 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 and I thank God for that, and man, if that's what they do. And, and, and there's some things that we operate differently here on that. But I do believe that it is important for us to understand what's taking place here through Scripture. And I'm going to give you some examples here of where doctrine divides and some distinguishments here. So look at Galatians 1. And I'd like for you to look at verses 6 through 9. Here is something so interesting. Paul obviously is writing to the church at Galatia. What an incredible event that took here, took place here. Thousands of people have gotten saved. Just an incredible movement of God and, uh, and into the lives of these Gentiles. Just an incredible background and story. But look at verse 6. Man, Paul gets right up, writes them a letter, and, and his first thought and, 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 and instruction or writing here is, I marvel, I'm astonished, I am utterly amazed that ye are so soon, notice this, removed from him that called you Christ into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You haven't been on the journey long, and you've taken a detour, Paul says. Then verse 7, which is not another. It's not really another gospel, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There's only one true gospel, folks. That's what Paul's saying. There's only one true gospel, and that's the gospel of Christ. So anything else is not a gospel. It's a man-made up thing. And Paul's just saying people are there to pervert the truth. And then verse 8. But though we, an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, that which ye have preached unto you, Paul says, let him be accursed. Paul said, anybody that comes to you, I don't care if it is, if it comes from above and it preaches something contrary than Christ's gospel. Man, that's some strong language right there. He says, let him be accursed. Verse 9, as we said before, so I... So say I now again, I'm going to repeat it. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, then what you know and what you received, what was taught unto you doctrinally, let him be accursed. There were Judaizers, folks. That's just Jewish legalists who came in and said, this is the way it should be done. And man, they were mixing in grace plus circumcision. Works. And Paul says, are we kidding? Are you serious? Paul says, anybody who comes in and preaches anything that is not in the right context of Christ's gospel... Paul says, let him be accursed. Let him be removed. Let him be rebuked. That's pretty strong. Uh, let me give you some other examples. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And then now this is, man, we're talking about doctrine should divide. We've got to be on point here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 
I'd like for you to look at verse 6. And I'd like for you to look at verse 14. So 6 and 14 here. 2 Thessalonians 3, chapter 3, verse 6 and 14. Verse 6 and 14. Here we go. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the addition which he had received of us. Verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, that word epistle means letter. By this letter, note that man, mark that man, point that man out, and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Now folks, would you look up here? We can't all hold hands and sing kumbaya with every church and every denomination that's out there. Why? Because doctrine matters. I don't care if you got a tie on, man. I don't care if you got a drum set. I don't care if you play the tambourine. I don't give a rip about that. That's awesome. That's great. I'm glad you have the talent to do so. Man, that's, I want to know, what are you teaching? What's happening behind the pulpit? What are your people learning? What are you teaching them? What is being taught? That matters to me. It should matter to you. And Paul, in his letters to the church, spent so much time on protecting the simplicity of the gospel, keeping the perversion of the gospels out, and making sure that those who brought in false doctrine were accursed. Man, he always warned about false doctrine, false doctrine, false doctrine, false teachers, wolves from within. It was over and over, over and over. Sounds like a broken record. I mean, I know you get tired of the message. I know sometimes it seems like, man, he just taught that, and that's all that I hear. I know because it's always happening. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. We have to be careful. These were people who were not living unto the doctrine that they had been taught. And Paul's like, hey man, what's, what's happened to you? You've been so far, you've been so easily removed, and, and, and yet you've heard, and you're not doing it. You're, you're not obeying. Here's what I want to say to you, church. I believe that church members ought to obey. And they ought to conduct themselves in a manner that is pleasing and honoring to the Lord. If you're going to be a member of this church, uh, you shouldn't be bar hopping Monday through Saturday. All right? You know what I'm saying? And then get up here on the platform and sing how great thou art. There is a dividing that we should do. And your lifestyle is a representation of the gospel. And when you live contrary to that, you are a pervert of the gospel. That word pervert is not sexual. It means you are a corrupter. It's wrong. You wouldn't let the pastor get away with it for 30 seconds. But we'll let everyone else in the church. Why? Because we like them. I've known him for a long time. I know, but how are they living? Are they living Christ-like? Thank God you don't have to wear a tie to be Christ-like. Amen. Who cares whether you have a tie on? Hey, how have you been living Monday through Saturday? That's what matters. And Paul is saying about even in this church, I mean, you saw it in Galatia, you see it in the church at Thessalonica. This church at Macedonia, you, you're seeing this. I'd like to take you to, a, to another guy. I'd like to take you to where Timothy, where he wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy. Um, 1 Timothy, that, that's right where you are. It shouldn't be a whole, don't, don't go too far. 1 Timothy, though, chapter 1. Now, I want you to look at verse 20. Then you're going to jump to chapter 2. But 1 Timothy, chapter 1, and look at verse 20. Now notice, he even names a couple people here. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto... What? Oh yeah, Satan. Man, he, he names them. 
He didn't say, I delivered them unto Jesus. I didn't deliver them unto the deacons. I delivered these folks unto Satan. I turned them right over. They belong to Satan. They're not of Jesus. That they may learn not to blaspheme. I'm going to tell you what. We're going to turn you right over to the world. That's what you follow. That's what you live for. That's how you talk. Go ahead and hang it out there. Don't bring that in here. You live like the world. You talk like the world. You act like the world. You smell like the world. We don't want that in here. See, we're trying to clean it up in here. We're, we're trying to act godly. We're trying to live godly. And Paul says, you know what? We love you. Well, y'all not very welcoming. No, we're not, Hymenius and Alexander. We're not to that. Now, if you want to repent and get right with God, welcome. But if you're going to come here and divide, if you're going to come here and cause a ruckus, Bible says you're going to have to do it out there. You do it out there. Hang out with that. world accept that, but we're not taking that here. Why? Because doctrine divides. It's not mean. Actually, it's very gracious and loving. Because the whole point is that is so you will reconcile and it's to restore you. It's so you will be out there and you will say, man, I had better fellowship when I was in. Now I'm out. I want to get back in. Well, there's one way in. It's called repentance. And it's doing what's right. And here it's interesting. These individuals were teaching false doctrine, but what were they doing? I mean, this is pretty serious. Turn them over to Satan? That they may learn not to blaspheme? What was it? Well, look at chapter 2, and I'll show you. Verses 16 in uh, chapter 2. 2 Timothy. I hope I told you that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 and 18. And notice, 16 through 18. He, here they are again, and he tells you why. It's not just because, hey, we, we, we can't get along, or we got preference differences. Or, or, or we, we, we have personal conflict. We have relational differences. Well, whoop de do. That has no bearing on any situation. Irreconcilable differences. Boy, that's what you hear in divorce court. That's what they put on their divorce. Court. Irreconcilable differences. You know what? God will reconcile that stupidness. Get right with God. And he'll reconcile. He'll put that thing back together. There's nothing that God can't do. There's nothing that He can't fix. Uh, that, statement is, that statement is irrelevant and is not in the vocabulary of Jesus. Th there's no such thing. But here, uh, 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 Paul absolutely rebukes them and removes them, and then he tells us why, and I'm thankful that we get to see this. Because it helps us. Verse 16, But shame... But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Here, would you look up here? That means quit the ratchet jaw and this right here. That, that's what that means. This is nonsense. This is all this right here. This means nothing. Vain babblings, just profane talk. That means you are just running off at the mouth. Your conversation, your, what you have to say absolutely adds nothing to the cause of Christ. It only hurts, does not help. It's absolutely counterproductive. And he says vain babbling, that is absolutely empty conversation. It is just, uh, you, you, ever, you ever seen Charlie Brown? Wah, 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 wah. That's exactly what this is. It is a lot of noise, but has no sub. It absolutely means nothing and helps nothing for the cause of Christ. Paul says, you know what? Just tune that out. Just cut that off. You shun that. That means you don't let that in. That means you stop that at the door. That, that means you, your desk. That means your office. That means your, your telephone. That means your text. That means your Facebook. Uh, that means uh, 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 your email. You know what? It is not a dumping ground uh, for people's garbage of verbiage. That's what that means. Stop letting people do that to you. Man, you, you cut that off. Why? Because we're going to walk of a godly sort. We're not going to walk the way of the heathen. We're going to do what pleases the honor of the Lord. Look at verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Here we go. Here you go. Because these guys were teaching wrong stuff and just, just ripping people apart 
and literally were dividing people emotionally, spiritually. That's what they were doing. I mean, it was a cancer. Verse 18. Who concerning the truth, here we go, have erred. Saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. You know what they're saying? Hey, uh, the the, the resurrection is past. In other words, what they were literally saying is that, you know what? Uh, uh, we are in the tribulation. In other words, we aren't in the age of grace. Man, that's all over. And we are now entering into the uh, time of wrath and judgment, which is on the timetable. Yes, which was on the future prophetic timetable. But that is not what's happening. It's not happening right now. It could happen before the service is over. But it was not happening then. It's not happening right now. But it will happen. And yet they're teaching, you know what? All that's over. And we are now enduring the tribulation. They were false teachers. You know what they were? They were fable spreaders. They were not speaking the truth. You know, you know what's necessary for this book to have any validity and power at all to change people's lives? It must be true. Do you know what you and I need in our lives? We need truth. I, I can create my own lies. I don't need you, I don't need you to lie to me. I, I've lived enough of that in my life. I lived enough lies of Satan for a long time. I gave him way too many years. But when I came to the acknowledgement of the truth, you know what it did? It set me free. And yet we will entertain lie after lie. And Paul lets us know, you know what? Out. We're, we're going to put an arm up to that. And when you want to repent of your ways, acknowledge that you were wrong, welcome back. But until then, you will have no fellowship here. Look, look at one more before we end tonight. Look at Titus. All right? Keep going to the right. Just one book to the right. You're in Galatians, Galatian, 1 and 2 Timothy. Now Titus. Let's go, Peyton. Come on. Are you looking at my notes or what, son? How, how are you getting there before I'm getting there? All right. Awesome. Good job. Keep it up. Proud of you. But you were looking at me like you were zoned out. Just want to make sure you were tuned in. All right? Titus, look at verse, uh, chapter 1, look at verses 11 through 14. Whose mouths must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses. Man, they, man, they, tear, they tear up the whole house. It ain't just a room they destroy. Man, boy, they just rip through the whole thing. Teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, saith, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. I mean, they're, man, they're, they're all liars. We're, we're the we are truth, but they're liars. I mean, just spreading stuff. This witness is true. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this has happened. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Man, you help them out by rebuking them. In other words, letting them know that you know that they're wrong, and you're pointing it out. What they do with that information is their problem. It's theirs to deal with, but, but you must do the right thing to help them. You're not helping them by not telling them the truth, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Did you notice that? It's so important. Paul is saying, look, there is so much stuff that comes in that just kind of and, and, and false teaching, those who get hooked up on, on deeds and performance and just, you know, you know, they get hung up on, instead of just Bible, they don't want to talk doctrine, they want to talk about philosophy. They want to talk about, in other words, an accommodating gospel for their uh, non-consenting to the Bible lifestyle. In other words, they want to live the way they want to live and, and not really be in line with God's Word. And so they try to find all these loopholes and Paul just says, you know what? We're, we're not going to entertain any of that. Doctrinal issues that divide 
are like, listen to me, the doctrine of salvation through faith alone in Christ. See, that's an issue to break fellowship over right there. That Christ was virgin born, that's a doctrinal issue. That the Bible is the inspired word of God, that is a doctrinal issue. I believe God inspired his words. In other words, God breathed this book. This is his book. This is his words to me and you. These are doctrinal issues and things that must be divided. They cannot be compromised and taken out. Now, what about the subject of now getting to church names and denominational names? Because now that you have a good understanding that doctrine matters and doctrine divides, you've got to be able to separate preferences. You've got to be able to separate uh, 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 things that you like. Well, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't like the color that you put on the walls. Okay. Can you still stay at the church, though? I mean, is that all right? I mean, can you work that out? I mean, can you overcome that? I, I don't like to paint at your house, but I'd still come there to eat if you invited me. I mean, what, what difference? Who cares? I'm glad there's paint on the wall. I'm glad we have sheetrock to put paint on. I, it's just silly, silly stuff. But we cannot overcome the issues of doctrine. So now that you have that, how do there get to be so many different denomination names? And by the way, as I go through these, I I'm going to be fair, and I'm going to pick on Baptists too. Okay, I I'm not I'm just going to over overlook that. I I'm going to figure out, you know, how, how did we, and, and it's an interesting study. And I'm not, for, uh, I'm not for one over the other. I just want to rightly divide God's Word with you. And, and I want you to come to the conclusion for yourself after you've studied it, what really matters. Say, where are you going with this? Are you changing the name of the church? Nope. I don't even have the power to change the name of the church. Did you know that? See, that is something you would vote on. Not having a choir, but we'd vote on the church name. But that's not even the issue. That's not the issue. The issue is outside of our church because all of those influences have a major impact with us. And they're going to have a greater impact in the days to come. The world is absolutely confused when they look at the denominations and the church names today. I, I have no idea why some names are what they are of some churches except that's what they wanted it to be but it's interesting how we might elevate those denominations or even those church names over doctrine because we get proud of our names but I want us to look at God's word and I want us to rightly divide it here's a question that I want us to answer not only did, where did the names come from of the churches and denominations, but here's a big one, because this is big in our community. I've been hammered about this. You can see me on Star News Channel all the time. Because of our friends down the street. And we love them, we just don't agree with them. We love them, but we don't agree with them. Is there any one church that has the right and biblical name? And that's, a, that's a good question and a lot of confusion about it. And, and by the way, to, to some's dismay, we are all wrong. We're wrong, according to many. We are wrong and they are right. And by the way, even to the point that we're going to go to hell because of it. We're wrong about it. And, I mean, they've, they've offered to take our sign down, our marquee down for us. No charge. Well, I can do that for no charge. I'll just run into it. What, what, what kind of... What, what is that? Who, who cares? Silly stuff. Silly. 
all for the point of argument's sake. You can't have a logical uh, 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 discussion. It's not even doctrinal. Because we just take Scripture out of context. Well, I'm going to answer that for us and help us out. And so I hope that you'll come back for this. And now that I've laid all the groundwork, man, we can lay into some stuff next week. And I hope you'll come back. As a matter of fact, I hope you'll come back ready to open your Bibles in a lot of different places. And here's the thing. I hope you'll come back eager to learn some things uh, because I want you to come with, with no pre- preconceived thoughts, not trying to change your mind about something. I, I just... But you may have to confront something that you may have been taught or grew up from years ago. Okay? And, and I, I just want to give you God's Word, and you can have a total different opinion than I do, and that's awesome, that's great. But... But scripturally speaking, we got to look at this and see what it says. You know what? It might be Baptist, but it might not be. It might be Pentecostal, but it may not be. Who knows? We're going to find out from God's Word because God knows. And actually gives a lot to say about it. And that's going to be good for us. All right? So I hope that that piques your interest a little bit. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for tonight. And Lord, we... We don't have the corner market on this. Baptists can be wrong as anyone else. Lord, we aren't perfect, but we do have a perfect Christ. And it's to Him that we look to. It's to Him that we serve. It's Him that we love. It's Him that we worship. It's Him that we learn from. And so, Lord, I think that there can be many differences and and still fellowship. That's what's beauty, beautiful about the body of Christ. There can be many preferential differences, and we're okay. But many divide over that instead of dividing over what's biblical. So, Lord, may we always stand true on what you say and hold true to that and stand on that instead of standing on our opinions or our thoughts or what we like best, because we all have those as well. And I'm thankful that we can come together, though, and look at this and still come out acting like mature Christians. And God, I just pray that you help us to see it as you see it, uh, not to ruffle people's feathers, but just to be biblical in our knowledge. So God, help us to see your truth and to understand it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.